Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. That portion of God's holy word which we consider this morning, the Holy Spirit caused the Apostle John to write for our learning and our comfort. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming that whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father, nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Let us pray. I know my faith is founded on Jesus Christ, my God and Lord, and this my faith confessing unmoved I stand upon his word. Our reason cannot fathom the truth of God profound, who trusts in human wisdom, relies on shifting ground. God's word is all sufficient. It makes divinely sure, and trusting in its wisdom, my faith shall rest secure. Amen. The Christian lives only by faith. But everybody has faith in something. Everybody, even atheists, take some things on faith. And that's the way we are in a world that neither knows the Father nor the Son. But Christian faith is entirely different from the faith of this world. Christian faith doesn't rely on any of our own natural powers. Now, worldly faith, though, it relies on man's own free will and his own ability to do whatever it is his goal to do. Christian faith relies solely on Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Worldly faith relies on what man has done or decided or figured out. Christian faith rejects every good work that we could do as it clings only to the work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The world relies on every good work she does. And it is because of this stark contrast and difference between the Christian faith and the faiths of this world that Christians will always suffer persecution for the sake of the gospel. Now, nowadays, as people are growing increasingly apathetic and hostile to the Bible's teachings in our country, some Christian teachers have taken it upon themselves to make the gospel sound less offensive to the world. But this is never going to work. The gospel rejects all pride and power of the world. When we confess that Jesus and Jesus alone, God's son and Mary's child, is the way, the truth, and the life, and that every man is guilty before God, and that all the world's spiritual efforts are worthless in God's sight, the world is insulted and takes offense. You simply can't stop the gospel from being offensive to people. They trust their own minds and their own spirits. They, they don't want to admit that they can't do anything to save themselves, anything to bring themselves closer to God, anything to make themselves look better to God before they have to admit that they're poor and miserable sinners. And they don't want to admit that they can't continue to live relying on their own understanding or continuing in this or that sin that pleases them. And so when Christ comes and tells the world that unless they believe his words, they will die in their sins, she gets angry. Listen to how Luther puts it. Reason thinks one can easily preach the gospel in a beautiful and simple and plain way without a revolution in the world and it will be heartily welcomed. This is the utterance of Satan. That's Luther. For if I believe and say that faith in Christ alone does and accomplishes all, I overthrow all the monkey play of the whole world, and that they cannot allow. Therefore, Christ's teachings and man's teachings cannot stand together. One must fall. 
You know, one of my professors at the seminary told me not to quote Luther from the pulpit. Well, he's not teaching at the seminary anymore, but I think I'm going to take that up with him. I mean, that's a good quote, isn't it? The point is, is that without the Spirit of God, we will remain in our sins. It's not sugarcoating anything that makes somebody believe it. We don't make people believe the gospel. The gospel is inherently offensive to people because it preaches only Christ's righteousness and rejects all of the so-called distinctions of good works that people want to use to defend themselves. Without the Holy Spirit, who preaches Christ crucified, we will remain in our sins. And so Jesus, who loves us, sends the Spirit of God. And he calls him the helper, or the comforter is another word, our advocate. The Greek word is paraclete. You'll, you'll sing that in hymns sometimes. So how does the Holy Spirit help and comfort? Does he give you a lot of moral lessons to make you better in the eyes of the world? Does he make you enjoy your life better and have your best life now, as a certain false teacher from the Houston area preaches? Or does he give you faith in Christ and then lead you into all sorts of trials that really aren't all that comfortable? He testifies about Jesus. That's how he comforts you. He comforts you with the only thing that can stand against your sins and against your weak conscience and against death and the hell that people deny exists, but everybody knows is coming if they would just once examine why they even have accusations in their conscience. The Holy Spirit only talks about Jesus. He rejects all of our holiness. He doesn't need anything that we give him to do his work. He is intolerant of any holiness of his own because the Son sends him. The Father sent the Son, and if the Holy Spirit proceeds, that is, goes out from the Father, then he will say what the Father wants him to say. And what does the Father want the Holy Spirit to say? He wants him to talk about Jesus because he gave his only Son to death for us. The Holy Spirit doesn't want to flatter us, and the Father doesn't want him to do that. He wants him to talk about what we need. He wants him to talk about the truth. And that is why Jesus calls him the Spirit of Truth. Imagine that, truth. Pilate said, what is truth? And people say that again today. I just heard a song on the radio yesterday, Losing My Religion. And it almost makes the song is so cool that it almost makes you want to lose your religion. You know, not knowing the truth is somehow an appealing thing. That you're always looking for the truth, but you never quite grasp it. And then so the virtue then becomes how well you are tolerant of other things and how much knowledge you can show to other people, but I don't know the truth. But really, this is just a sham humility. Imagine a religion that is completely founded upon the truth. Well, the world in this false humility preaches, no one can ever completely know the truth. You Christians even admit that you are sinners. And so if everyone is a sinner, then how can anyone claim so boldly as to know the truth and stake everything on this one teacher, Jesus Christ, and reject everything else? You Christians should learn some humility and not be so bold to condemn the world. But we do not confess our truth. We confess God's truth. We confess what the Holy Spirit teaches. If we confess our own truth, then we would die in our sins. The truth we have didn't come from us, and therefore it isn't we who are arrogant as we cling to the truth, but the world, because the world thinks that truth comes from inside yourself. And so she, in her pride, clings to whatever truth she comes up with or finds appealing to herself, and she's perfectly willing not to impose her truth on another person as long as she gets to believe her own truth that makes her live the way that she wants to live. The humility that we learn in contradistinction to this sham humility of the world that really is the most judgmental humility that you could ever imagine, the humility that we learn is that we are poor and wretched sinners. And this doesn't change as long as we live in this flesh before the resurrection of the body. And this is something which the world will only admit as long as she is given a way out with her works. You see, the world will admit that she's a sinner. Even I have atheist friends who admit that they are sinners, whatever that means. They'll admit that they make mistakes, but they always leave themselves a passage out. They won't acknowledge that they're bound completely in it unless the Holy Spirit delivers them. But the Holy Spirit doesn't leave any way out. He doesn't. He confines you completely in your sin. 
He shows you in the law that you have nothing inside of yourself and nothing in your natural powers to deliver yourself. And that even as a Christian, you rely solely upon the grace of God to do any good work, to believe in him. And so he convicts the world of sin. Why? Because they don't believe in Jesus, as the gospel lesson last Sunday spoke of. Spoke of. And this means that all sins, all the sins that the Holy Spirit exposes by preaching the law are forgiven, except the sin against the Holy Spirit that is persistently refusing to believe his testimony about Jesus. This will not be forgiven, but whoever believes, whoever does not believe shall be condemned. Now the world rages against this. She doesn't want to come into this light that exposes her deeds. She doesn't want the forgiveness of sins, or at least not that much of the forgiveness of sins, and so she gradually slips into worse and worse sins as she defends what she's doing. And so we were told about 100 years ago, we began to be told that the Bible has errors because we don't worship a book, but God. And then we became ignorant bigots for claiming that the testimony of the Spirit made through his apostles, Christ's witnesses, is true. And then once you got scripture's inerrancy out of the way, we were told that divorce is all right, that God wants people to be happy, and we became insensitive bigots for teaching that divorce outside of sexual immorality is adultery and sin. And then we were told that God wants us to love one another as long as a man and a woman love one another, then they can have marital relations without marriage. And we became bigoted prudes for pouring salt on their sinful wounds and confessing that Christ forgives repentant sinners, not those who continue to live in their sins and cling to them. And then the distinction between man and woman was assaulted, and they told us that God made everyone equal, and this means, therefore, we are resisting God's will when we teach that a woman can't be a pastor or pretend to be one. <clears throat> and finally, the president of the most powerful country in the world joined his daughters in confessing before the world that the unmentionable sin of Sodom is a virtue that should be sanctioned by law. And what are we now in the eyes of the world? We are hypocritical, intolerant bigots because we continue to pour our salt on them and confess that Jesus forgives the sins of real sinners, not those who claim that God gives them every sinful desire they have. See, they claim that we're intolerant, but it's God who is intolerant of sin. And the Christian understands, and he knows, and he can freely confess his sin because he knows the way out. He knows that he doesn't live by the law, and so he readily confesses, yes, Lord, you call me a sinner, like the Canaanite woman said, yes, Lord, call me a little dog, but even the crumbs, dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And so the Christian knows that she doesn't, he doesn't need to live by the, by the law. She lives by faith. And nevertheless, she must confess the law. And we have been, when we have been justified by grace, that is, when we have been declared righteous in God's sight and pure and innocent apart from the law and all that we have done, and we have been freed from its condemnation because Christ was condemned in our place, yet at the same time, we learn to love our neighbor with our bodies. And then what do we find? That in our bodies there are these desires that go against our neighbor, that we don't want to love them with all as ourselves. We don't want to love God above all things. And so we see, we take the law and we use it against our flesh. And this is what the Apostle Paul calls crucifying the sinful flesh, that is repentance. We need correction and rebuke since we are still sinners. And so we should not give ammunition to those who mock the gospel of Christ so that they can point to our lives and call us hypocrites who stand in judgment of the world while we ourselves do what they condemn or what we condemn. And this is what Paul, uh, Peter means when he says in the epistle lesson for today, the end of all things is at hand. That is the judgment. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. 